Um, so it's nice to see so many people sign up. First of all, that was really exciting. And then uh, come in to learn a little bit about gene therapy today. Um, the way I've kind of styled my lecture is, or lecture, I wanted it to be more seminar. So the first half is going to be more introductory and um, presenting three different uh, cases of genetic diseases. And the second half will be a little more the future perspectives of that um, and what all the, the recent kind of CRISPR headlines really mean. Um, so I know this is a slightly bigger class, but if you have any questions as the presentation arises, just feel free to unmute yourself and speak out. Um, if it helps you feel more comfortable, you can uh, to speak as well. You can turn your camera on, um, but I also understand for, for privacy or internet reasons, that might be a little more complicated. Um, otherwise, feel free to send messages in the chat. Um, I'll do my best to catch all of them. And Cody, if any come up that I'm not replying to, feel free to interrupt me to make sure I get those too. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so um, the official title is Genetic Disease and How to Cure Them. I was trying to make it a kind of twist on the phrase fantastic beasts and how to find them, but one of my friends told me that that went over her head, so I just wanted to point it out. Um, and it's a really just an introduction to gene therapy, kind of how um, a brief history of how we've tried to use it in the past and how we could be using it in the future. Um, and so, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I really like this comic. I got it from a friend of mine. Um, and I just like having like a little joke in the, in the intro slide. Um, but yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk about CRISPR a bit at the end. Um, but before then, there are actually quite a few things in gene therapy that have arisen historically that, that are outside of CRISPR, so. Okay, so as I mentioned, there's gonna be a kind of different sections of this uh, class. We're gonna talk about an introduction. We're new three cases, and then if we have time, We'll do a quick break and then talk about future perspectives um, and et cetera. So first briefly as an introduction, I just want to explain what is gene therapy because I, I was telling Cody before the class started, one of my friends in my PhD program with me was like, if you asked me to give you a definition of this, I actually wouldn't know what I would say. And there's kind of two big parts of the gene therapy definition. One is that you have to have some kind of nucleic acid, which is the term for the macromolecules class that includes DNA and RNA. And this nucleic acid has to be administered with the goal to modify or replace some kind of genetic sequence that you already have, some gene that should already be in your genome. And the desired effect of the therapy, of the treatment, has to be directly due to the administration of this nucleic acid. Then that brings about the question of, okay, what is this term administration is really, really vague. What are we talking about? And it has to do with the delivery of how you actually get this nucleic acid, this DNA, this RNA into your system. And um, there are a number of different ways to do it, but the two most common in therapy have been naked, naked DNA, which is just sending in the DNA completely by itself into the system or through some kind of virus. Um, and we'll go more in depth into that in a second. But one question I did want to bring up to you all is the idea that with the recent COVID-19 mRNA vaccine, there's been debate as to whether or not, or there's been points brought up that say, okay, well, we're injecting RNA into our system. We're injecting this nucleic acid into our system. Does this count as gene therapy? Um, and I don't have an official poll for this, but I wanted to ask you all, based on the two sets of this definition, does the COVID mRNA vaccine fit into the definition of gene therapy and why or why not? And if y'all just want to unmute yourselves or pop something in the chat. Or if y'all are unsure too, you're welcome to say that. Okay, so we have a couple answers coming into the chat. Yes, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it is RNA, um, as you mentioned. Okay, my chat's still there. Uh, it is RNA, so it does fulfill that part of the definition. 
but yes, y'all are y'all were mentioning that it doesn't directly modify, replace, or affect the genome. You're not actually editing anything within yourself. So while it does satisfy the definition of being a nucleic acid, and in some ways you could say that it that its desired effect is due to this nucleic acid because you're making the um, the spike protein, you're not actually exist modifying an existing genetic sequence. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I brought this up. Uh, I wasn't planning on bringing up anything about COVID because I feel like that's all anyone talks about in science seminars lately. Uh, but this actually came up a lot while I was doing research for this presentation. And I, was, uh, I thought it was an interesting point to clarify in relation to, to gene therapy. OK, so now back on track. Uh, I mentioned there are two big ways to administer the DNA or RNA associated with gene therapy. And the latter of these was through some kind of viral transfer. Of these viral transfers, there are two types of viruses that you can hijack, that you can replace the genome of to act as gene therapy shuttles or vectors. So in the first case, there's going to be something like an adenovirus. So adenovirus is the viruses, a uh, class of viruses that tend to um, give you things like the common cold. And so in a, in a situation like this, what you can do is you can take the virus kind of capsule, you can take the, the surrounding um, shell of it, and then you replace its genome with whatever DNA you're interested in using in your gene therapy. Then based on the way the adenovirus life cycle works, the virus will go into the cell. So I should clarify this little schematic I made with the shapes option of PowerPoint. There's uh, the yellow part here is the, the cell surrounded by the cell membrane. We have the nucleus in gray, and then the chromosomes that are cartoonized uh, in this shape if you know enough about biology, technically, this isn't what the chromosomes look like outside of metaphase, but just for the sake of the presentation, I have represented the DNA in this form. <clears throat> and so, as I mentioned, the adenovirus is gonna come in. It's going to disassemble because the goal of the virus life cycle is to get its own genetic material into the cell. It's gonna disassemble and release its genetic material, which is the gene therapy DNA you've engineered. This genetic material will, will go into the nucleus, where it can then be transcribed and later on translated into your functioning gene product, with the goal of this gene product being whatever fixes the issue the person has in their cells. So this is the first form of viral transfer. The second form of viral transfer has a, is similar, but has a bit of a twist. So this is going to be through retroviruses. Retroviruses are viruses like HIV. And so what happens here is you can put your gene therapy genetic material once again into the, into the shell of your virus. The virus will go into the cell, release its genetic material, and the genetic material goes into the nucleus. This all sounds very familiar. The big twist on this one, though, is that this genetic material will want to directly integrate into the chromosomes, into the genome of the cell. From there, it will get transcribed and translated into your functioning gene product. Why does this matter? Why am I making so much emphasis on this distinction? Well, what happens in the previous case with your adenovirus is that this DNA, it'll hang around in the nucleus for a little while, but eventually it'll get lost. It might, it might not get inherited by the daughter cells. It might get degraded by enzymes found within the cell. And so this is not, in a sense, as permanent as retroviral gene therapy. With retroviral gene therapy, because you've gone through the step of the DNA actually integrating into the chromosome, the cell treats it as its own DNA. It preserves it and it replicates it as it, uh, the cell lives and divides. And so this change, in a sense, is a little more permanent than with adenoviruses. Okay, hopefully I'm not going too fast. Um, do you all have any questions on any of that so far? And no worries if a few details slipped your mind. Um, anything that's relevant about this section that comes up later, I'll, I'll bring up again later as well. Okay. So we can move on to our uh, first case, which is called X-linked SCID. SCID is short for severe combined immunodeficiency. Essentially, this is a collective term for a number of disorders where individuals do not develop their uh, adaptive immune system. In other words, they don't have the T cells, B cells, or just lymphocytes needed to fight off infection. And the very classic example of an individual with X-linked skid is this little guy, David Vetter, um, nicknamed the bubble boy 
in popular culture or in popular science. And he was born in about 1971 with this X-linked skid. And what happens with X-linked skid, because you don't have this adaptive immunity, is that um, the individuals that get infected tend to succumb to very casual infections that you and I might survive. Things like the flu or uh, the common cold will, will knock them out and, and can kill them. And so when uh, David's parents found out that he had this condition, they kept him in this giant septic bubble, um, hence the name Bubble Boy. And David Vetter um, could interact with, with his parents and with the doctors through these, these gloves that they could reach through and all of his toys and his food were completely sterilized before they were sent in. And um, NASA even designed him this little spacesuit that he could wear that was connected to the sterilized environment of his bubble so that he could wander around a bit in it um, and explore the world, although it was reported that he didn't uh, very much like it and tended to prefer to stay in his bubble. So, um, David Vetter's story is, is actually kind of tragic. Um, and to, to be able to explain why that is, I want to kind of talk about the genetic basis of X-linked skid. And what happens in diseases like this is that these, this purple cell represents the lymph, lymphocytes in the cells of your adaptive immune system that come from the bone marrow. And so um, within this bone marrow, you get these adult blood stem cells that will divide to give you say red blood cells or platelets or these lymphocytes. But what happens in patients like David is that there's a genetic disorder that prevents the appropriate development of these, of these lymphocytes. They will never form. And so because of that, you don't have your adaptive immune system. However, one way to go about this is uh, about dealing with this is what if you could just replace the bone marrow with healthy bone marrow, with a healthy adult blood stem cells that you could give rise to lymphocytes. And so you can do this through a bone marrow transplant if you have a donor where um, they, they have healthy adult blood stem cells. You have to some degree uh, what we call an HLA match, which ensures that the immune system of the patient um, will accept the uh, cells of the donor. You get rid of the bone marrow of the patient, replace it with the bone marrow of the donor, and now the healthy bone marrow can give rise to these, these cells that are important for this patient's survival. And so this is actually what was done with David Vetter. His daughter, uh, his daughter, his sister was found to be a match for his case. And so they did um, a, a bone marrow transplant and um, it actually seemed to take it, it, it settled into his bone marrow and started dividing and giving rise to these functioning lymphocytes that would eventually develop an adaptive immune system. However, this was done back in the 1970s, 1980s. And at the time, it wasn't very common to do screens for things like Epstein-Barr virus in the bone marrow of the donor. Epstein-Barr virus is a virus that actually tends to exist in a good number of the population. But because we have functioning adaptive immune systems, we can kind of keep it in check and at bay. So there are no symptoms. So a lot of people don't know they have it. And this was what happened to David's sister. David's sister had Epstein-Barr virus dormant within her bone marrow. It uh, moved to David within the transplant and began to overtake his body before he could develop an adaptive immune system. And he ended up succumbing from the symptoms of this disease as they took hold before his adaptive immune system could fully develop. Um, so this was very unfortunate and, and very tragic story given how much hope there was in this bone marrow transplant. And it brought about questions about um, what alternatives we could take. And now of course there's the advantage of now that we know that Epstein-Barr virus can do these kinds of things to patients without adaptive immune systems. There are screenings for uh, viruses like this within the bone marrow and, and um, you can avoid repeating this case and learn from it. But there's an alternative. What if instead of taking healthy blood stem cells from a donor, we could take the unhealthy blood stem cells from the patient, modify them to be healthy and put them back in. Now you don't have to worry about introducing foreign agents from another person or um, worry about this immune system match because these cells are coming right from the source. And uh, the cells, the source is at the end of the sink. It's, it's going back into itself. And so um, this was actually tried as well, I think in 1980s, 1990s after David Vetter's case. And so what happens is they could inject um, 
these unhealthy stem cells with a retroviral uh, shell surrounding the healthy DNA. So this is what we were talking about at the very beginning, where this retrovirus can carry your gene therapy DNA, can insert it into the genome of the host, and fix whatever problem you have. So the um, the gene that is that was sick in these that was mutant and not working in these patients could be replaced through this retroviral gene insertion. So then um, this is, you, you take out the adult blood stem cells, you modify them to make them healthy, you grow them up in a dish, and then you stick them right back into the bone marrow of the patient, where now they're healthy and they can give rise to these lymphocytes that give you an adaptive immune system. However, this story actually ends quite tragically as well. So I believe it was 10 to 12 patients that were given this treatment. Um, but one thing that was not considered at the time was that retroviruses insert their genes rather haphazardly into the genome. What does that mean? Well, that means that this, this diagram I showed y'all earlier, this DNA is uncoded and the cytoplasm goes into the nucleus and fits into the chromosomes. This is done completely randomly. I, I drew this little green DNA here, but it could have integrated over here, over here, over here. And there are already genes that are functioning within the, the um, nucleus that you don't want to interrupt. And so what happens is that if you interrupt genes that are important for normal cell division, um, you can end up with things like cancer. So that's actually what happened in a, vast, in a good number of the cases that underwent this treatment. Um, they ended up with leukemia, which is the, the successive division of um, white blood cells and lymphocytes um, because they, there was an interruption of genes that drove uh, cancer within these patients. Okay, so that's case number one. Anyone have any questions or comments to share about case one? Okay, if not, feel free to put something in the chat as anything comes up. Um, but the second case that we're gonna talk about, I promise is a little less tragic um, than, than the examples of the first case. And it's gonna be through a disease known as junctional epidermolysis bullosa, or JEB. This one's not uh, quite as well known in popular culture as X-linked skin, but it is um, a really fascinating genetic disease. Just as a heads up, before I move to the next screen, if anyone's a little squeamish, um, the symptoms of this disease are rather uncomfortable. You get a lot of blistering across your body um, and you lose a lot of your epidermis. Um, but that looks something like this, essentially. This is a patient that presented with a very severe form of junctional epidermolysis bullosa, I believe in uh, 2015, so not all that long ago. Essentially, um, this was a, a schematic of the kid anywhere in red. He has completely lost his epidermis or the top layer of your skin. And anywhere in green, there was actually pretty severe blistering. And so you can imagine life like this is incredibly painful. Um, Individuals with this disease usually don't live all that long because without your epidermis, you're subject to a large number of infections that usually your skin can just physically keep out. Um, and of course, you can't have a normal functioning social life. Imagine trying to go about your day um, without your skin. That would just be tragic. Um, and so this disease has actually an interesting genetic basis. What happens here is if you just take a, a chunk of, of your skin and a little bit of what's below it, there are two big layers that it consists of. The top is this epidermis, epi being above and dermis being the lower layer here. The epidermis of your skin, which is made up of keratinocytes and has, um, uh, it's if you kind of rub your skin off the the white blood cell, the, the white little skin flakes that come off, that'll be part of your epidermis as well. And then lower beneath that is your dermis. So you get your sweat glands um, and you get your, uh, your hair fall, fall, follicles. So in a normal individual, you have to have something that keeps together your epidermis and your dermis. And the thing that does that is this protein complex known as laminin. So laminin is actually physically shaped as a, a kind of anchor. It has three different subunits that come together and it kind of anchors together the epidermis and the dermis. It'll go across these two layers to connect them. And one of the big components of this laminin complex is the gene product of a gene known as LAM3. 
So what happens, what happens specifically in this case with this patient and with a lot of patients that have G JEB is that they have a mutation in their LAM3 gene. So they can't properly form this anchoring laminin protein. And because of that, the epidermis can come right off. What happens is you, you get all the space, you the fluid fills it like with blisters and um, eventually it, it will just shed. And so what you can do to go about this is say, okay, if I have my keratinocyte, my epidermal skin cell that doesn't have a functioning LAM3, what if I can just force expression of functioning LAM3 once again through a kind of retroviral gene insertion? And so that's actually what um, the doctors with this, this case did. They retrovirally inserted a functioning LAM3 gene within a keratinocyte. They grew up the keratinocytes into large sheets and they could, it, could put it right back on the patient. Essentially, they gave him a skin graft of his own fixed skin on over 80% of his body. That's a huge amount of skin. 80% of his own skin went back onto himself fixed. And it was actually very successful. The individual um, went back for checkups quite a few times and it looks like the, the graft was normal. There weren't any, um, any unprecedented side effects and et cetera, or unexpected side effects or et cetera. Um, so this is one of the recent case, I think this was in 2016, a uh, recent case of successful gene therapy. However, one question y'all might be asking yourselves is, what about cancer? I just told you guys, if you do retroviral gene insertion, it's completely random. You can disrupt all these genes. Well, why didn't this kid end up with cancer the same way the patients with X-linked skin did? That's actually for two, two reasons that they decided to do retroviral gene therapy, despite this previous catastrophe in the other case. The first is that patients with JEB already have a really high predisposition to cancer. So they figured if he gets cancer from this successful skin graft, at least he'll have this success, successful skin graft. He already has a risk for this cancer to begin with. So there's not really quite as much to lose. And this is actually a very big thing to consider when picking a kind of therapy for treating disease. Uh, cancer is a really big example. It's what are the costs and benefits compared to what you're getting. A lot of people tend to push for kind of any therapy that helps, but you have to consider what are you really sacrificing to keep the life um, of a patient continuing? And in this case, the sacrifice was worth it because it was already a risk that he carried. Okay. Secondly, is that now that we knew of this risk, you can actually screen the cells that you reinsert into the patient. You can sequence before you put the skin grafts back to check for insertion sites. So you can see whether or not the random insertion of the retrovirus cause disruption of any genes that you would predict would cause cancer. And in this case, they didn't see an enrichment of disruption of genes that might cause cancer. So they figured these skin grafts were safe. Um, so this is, this is a happy story of gene therapy. You know, this kid lives as, as normal of a life as you can with, with gene B. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah, I like that. That story makes me happy. I know it's a very tragic medical case, but it's really fun to see that with our knowledge of a very basic science like retroviruses, simply how they work, we can we can change people's lives, which is which is exciting to think about. Okay. The third and final example that I will give y'all is Duchenne muscular dystrophy or DMD. So this one um, you might be a little more familiar with or have heard of before. I think it's more common than the other two. In cases like this, they tend to usually present in males based on the way that the associated gene is inherited. And what happens is you tend to get wasting away of muscle that causes loss of uh, functional movement. And so this uh, kid here is an example of um, how the symptoms tend to manifest themselves. You get patients that tend to be confined to wheelchairs before their young adolescence, and the long-term survival outlook usually isn't all that good. Um, patients tend, tend to die very, very young. And so the genetic basis of this is um, that if you take, if you look at just the whole muscle of an individual, if you think of your, your typical kind of red striated muscle shape, if you cut a cross section of this, you'll see that it's actually made up of muscle fibers 
within a muscle fiber bundle, this kind of blue shape here. Um, and if you zoom in on the muscle fiber itself, the little red here, it's actually made of um, this, this muscle filament, which is connected to the, the blue part, the muscle fiber, fiber membrane through this protein known as dystrophin. So dystrophin is the red link that connects this little pink fiber to the blue surrounding bundle to be able to make a whole muscle. Hopefully that makes sense. As you might guess, based on the name of Dutchings muscular dystrophy, this dystrophin gene and protein product is what's modified and mutated in these patients. And so without this dystrophin, you lose uh, the, the formation of these normal muscle fibers, bundles, and their affordable muscles. Okay. So then comes about the question of how do you treat this? And this therapy is gonna be a little bit different and a little bit more complicated than the past, the past two examples. So what this case is, um, for what about 20% of, of DMD cases are, is that if you take your dystrophin DNA, if you look at the gene that actually makes it up in this sequence here, there's a mutation in one exon or one part of the gene that essentially impacts the rest of the gene. So because this little green part is mutated, the blue, the orange, and the yellow parts are not going to be functional. However, what would be great is if you could just skip out this green part. It's semi, it's not completely normally functional, but this gene is somewhat functional if you keep the blue, the red, and the yellow without the green. And so the question is, how do you leave this part out of your final gene product? And you can do this through um, this treatment known as ASO or antisense oligo. And this antisense oligo essentially is a, a tiny little stretch of nucleic acid that's complementary to the region your mutation is in. This allows it to bind to the site of the mutation while the cell is trying to express this gene. And because it's bound there, it hides that part of the, um, of the gene from the cell trying to make it. And the cell will just skip right over it um, and include only the blue, red, and yellow and restore to some extent the functioning nature of this gene. And so this is called exon skipping technology. You're skipping the part with the mutation um, with the idea that you can keep the rest. And um, the final product then looks like this blue, red, and yellow. You've left off the green and it's a somewhat functioning dystrophin protein. And this is actually an example of an uh, not over the counter, but a, um, a more well established, I suppose, drug when you think about it with respect to gene therapy. These last few cases, what we've been talking about are things that you have to do in the lab. You have to take the cell out, you have to genetically modify it and put it back in. That's not really something you can do at home. You have to go um, to usually these, these trials that are not quite FDA approved yet, that are in the, hence the word, are in the trial um, phase. And so, um, it's not really quite as accessible. So Edipleersin is the name of the drug that is this little ASO, this antisense oligo that patients can take um, to try to deal with, with DMD. However, this, if this all sounds too good to be true, that's because it kind of is. Treatments like this actually cost around $300,000 a year. So it's very hard to um, feasibly treat yourself for DMD throughout, imagine not only in a year, imagine just throughout a lifetime. Um, there's also a big debate over whether or not it works. So um, around the time that this was presented to the FDA, there was a lot of controversy within the FDA over is this really effective? Um, and a few members of the board that was overseeing the acceptance of Edda Pearson um, resigned, left the FDA. And following their departure, there was actually accelerated approval to get this accepted. Um, so very fishy to me, um, but the, the details of that are, are, are a little murky as well. And on top of that, this Edipleersin, while approved by the FDA in the States, is not approved at all in the EU, um, in the European Union. And so it was represented a few years after its original approval in the states, but the EU decided not to pass it, or the EU's version of the FDA decided not to pass it um, because they were not convinced that it was, it was efficient. Um, so in theory, 
the science is beautiful and it holds up, um, but there's a lot of caveats with connecting things from theory to the actual um, application of these kinds of technologies. There's a lot of external factors that influence whether or not a therapy works. Like we saw with the retroviral gene therapy, the original incidences of cancer were not expected. Um, and so there's usually a lot of caveats and things are not quite as clear cut as we would like to present them as. Okay. Um, so as I've mentioned, we're gonna be talking about CRISPR is the big, the big hot topic. Um, it was, as some of y'all seem to know, it was given to um, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dudna, um, who were the first two women to share the Nobel Prize. Um, and it was actually discovered, if you don't know the history of how the discovery was made, it was discovered completely on accident. Um, and so um, the story behind this, if, if you guys ever read, uh, Jennifer Dudna has a great book on it. Um, I'm totally blanking on the name, but she gives kind of a background of how, <laughs> how the, I'm glad y'all appreciate my, my Chris Pratt meme. My mom didn't get it. She's like, I don't know who that is. I'm like, whatever. Um, but anyway, so Jennifer Dudna uh, wrote, wrote a book kind of explaining how she came about to help discover CRISPR. And it was actually made, discovery made completely on accident. So she was looking at how uh, bacteria fight off their own viral infection. So there's a specific class of viruses known as bacteriophages that only infect bacteria. And they're actually very problematic um, in, in dairy industries, for example, because you need your, your bacteria in, in your yogurts and in your cheeses and et cetera. Um, and so it's actually a very expensive industry. Um, and it was part of what she dived into originally. And so um, what she found was that bacteria have their, their own immune system known as, known as uh, CRISPR now is what we call it. And what this allows the bacteria to do is retain a memory essentially of the bacteriophages that have infected them before and allow them to cut up the DNA of the invading virus um, to help preserve their own health. And so this was actually hijacked to be uh, to allow us to cut up our own DNA and modify it, as I'll explain in a minute how the details of that work. So because of that, I really like the quote um, by Ralph Waldo Emerson, which is that science does not know its debt to the imagination. A lot of very big scientific breakthroughs are actually made completely on accident when investigating completely unrelated topics, like how do you make making uh, cheese and yogurt more effective. Okay, so I'm going to give a brief overview of how um, CRISPR actually functions. So let's say you have some stretch of DNA that I've, I've shown in. I realize I can do my little uh, my pointer. I should have been doing that the whole time. Okay, hopefully you'll see that better. But you have your, your stretch of DNA, your genome shown in blue here, and then your gene of interest shown in, in green. And maybe this is a gene um, like the X-linked skid case that you want to repair to help the, um, the bone marrow cells be healthy again. So what you can do is send in this CRISPR slash Cas9 or sometimes shortened Cris to CRISPR complex in. And so what this is um, very technically is this, this large protein known as Cas9 and bound within it is this gRNA, this guide RNA. And this guide RNA can be engineered to be complementary to the sequence you're interested in, to this green gene of interest. And so because of that, it'll guide the whole complex, this whole protein hunk over to the gene that you're interested in, cause it to make what we call a double strand break or a cut across the genome. And then after that, CRISPR's job is actually done. What we're left with is this double strand break, this, this cut within the genome. And so the cell doesn't, doesn't like having holes in its, in its genes. Um, it'll want to repair this because if you leave these holes, you end up with a very unstable genome that causes cancer or cell death. So the cell has uh, two main methods of dealing with cut genes. The first is through this very error-prone repair mechanism. Essentially what it does is like, okay, we'll just clean up the edges here and we'll paste it back together. But in this cleanup, this cut and paste process, you actually tend to lose a lot of genetic information, which oftentimes causes the gene to become non-functional. This process is also known as non-homologous end joining. Um, but the, the big thing to take away is that there's a lot of error to it. 
And so because of that, you lose your gene function. So this can be helpful in say things that are turned on all the time, like in cancer, genes can mutate to constantly divide. And if you could go in and just shut them off by cutting them with CRISPR, you could help slow down that cell division. But if you're trying to do more, more complex and fine things like um, put in a functional dystrophin and then help deal with your, the, the DMD, the Dutch genes muscular dystrophy, you don't want to keep breaking the gene, it's already broken. So what you want is to replace it with a functional copy. And CRISPR can actually help with this too, because there's a second pathway the cell can use to fix this hole. So now say we're, we're targeting our dystrophin gene, we've made our cut, and we can encourage the cell to go through this high accuracy repair mechanism known as homologous recombination. In this case, you send in a template, say this orange template is a functional form of the dystrophin gene. Now you've made your cut, and this orange template will, will undergo this homologous recombination to be knocked in, to, to take over the spot of this old gene. And so now where before you had this broken dystrophin gene, maybe now you have a normally functioning dystrophin gene. And so how could this apply in a less abstract manner? Maybe we could use it in cases like the David Better's bubble boy case. So what if we could avoid this fear of having our, our retroviral gene insertion cause things like leukemia by instead of you know, hoping for the best or even doing the screen like the JEB case where we could see whether or not head inserted, if we can use CRISPR to tell the gene edit exactly where to happen, and then we can avoid, we could theoretically avoid that problem altogether. So could theory, in theory, CRISPR solve our problem? The answer is hopefully yes. So we could, um, in this case, take out our adult blood stem cells that don't make our lymphocytes. Instead of using our retroviral gene transfer, we can do some CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing and then put the healthy blood stem cell back into the body to restore the ability to make lymphocytes. And so, um, this technology, I think, is still under way of, of being applied. Um, I'm not quite sure what the latest is on, on when it'll come about, but of course, it's while it does provide us with a lot of hope, it's also important to remain reserved and cautious, like in cases with our retroviral gene transfer that caused cancer, that one wasn't expected. And when the, the trials first came about, everyone was really excited that it was gonna work. Um, so CRISPR, of course, is not without its faults and caveats, which are important to keep in mind. But there is a lot of, of hope um, that it, it helps avoid a lot of problems that we faced in the past and could revolutionize gene therapy. Okay. Ooh, hold on, I can't click the chat with my pointer. Okay. Is the part of the cell that checks for the double strand part of the DNA? Um, so that's a good question. Uh, I assume kind of what you're asking is how does the cell check that that this break actually occurs? Um, and it's actually not officially part of the DNA. It's more proteins outside of the DNA will, that will recognize that, hey, this this end shouldn't be here. Yeah. Um, so if, if you think about like the way your genome is shaped as... Um, you know, these, these long stretches of DNA as chromosomes. At the end of the chromosomes, usually you expect some kind of, uh, there are like proteins associated there that tell the cell, hey, this is supposed to end. Mm -hmm. But then in the middle, if you make a cut in the middle, they're like, hey, this isn't the normal end of a chromosome. So these proteins will be recruited to the site um, and, and tell the cell, hey, we, we need to fix this. But yeah, good. that's a good question. Um, you're, you're very welcome. I also did have a, a question that I got asked earlier um, by someone asking about the difference between gene editing and gene therapy. So I just did want to clarify for everyone um, that gene editing and gene therapy do have some overlap. So this case of CRISPR here is a case of gene editing. It's how a lot of gene editing is done now. Um, but it doesn't always have to be applied for gene therapy. So gene editing can be used for gene therapy, but it can also be used for things like creating um, animal models, like appropriate mouse models in lab. And there it's not gene therapy anymore because you're actually making them sick, which is unfortunate, um, but good for research. Um, so not all gene editing is gene therapy, although it can be used for such. And not all gene therapy is gene editing because you can do things like our adenovirus or our retrovirus gene insertion, where we're not actually editing a gene all the time, we're just putting in a, a normal copy. 
So I just wanted to clarify that for anyone that might have had the, the same question. Okay. Let me go to the next slide and check. Okay, should be doing okay on time. Okay, yeah, thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, I like the sanity checks that this is all making sense for everyone. Please feel free to tell me if anything I'm saying um, doesn't make any sense. Okay, um, so then I did wanna bring up the big headline um, that y'all are probably very familiar with. Um, oh, hold on, I mentioned this already, but what happens if the proteins are checked for that? So it's these disease genes, that's correct ones. Okay, um, let me see how I wanna address this. What happens? So if the proteins that check for the accuracy of the DNA, what they're checking for in this case of CRISPR is that there's a hole. So as long as the DNA that you put in fills the hole, as long as the hole isn't there anymore, it doesn't know what the exact sequence is necessarily gonna be. Um, so it's not gonna attack a gene that's put in as long as that gene fixes the gap that occurs. Does that make sense? Okay, great, so yeah. Yeah, thank you for asking. Okay. Um, yeah, no problem. All right, so the headline here is one that y'all might have seen come up a few years ago that sparked a lot of discussion on um, CRISPR modification, which is the idea that uh, Dr. He used CRISPR to make uh, what he claimed to be genetically edited babies, although I don't know if there, I, I do know that there wasn't officially a report showing, um, a scientific report showing that it was a successful modification, but this sparked a lot of debate because it's actually the first time that CRISPR was used or there was really any genetic modification used to edit at the embryonic level. And so, um, yeah, there are, there are a lot of very, um, when talking about CRISPR, a lot of implications for eugenics and, and social justice. And it's, I think that's one of the reasons I love doing presentations like this is that I think it's really important um, for people to really understand what the implications are and aren't of this technology, because if it can provide us hope for, for curing gene therapy, we don't want to shut it down, but we don't want it to go rampant um, and contribute to really, really awful policies either. So it's, I think it's one of the reasons, and Jennifer Dudna talks about it a lot in her book, why it's important to have kind of open table discussions about this kind of stuff. Um, so, um, all right, so there are two big categories of gene editing that you can do. And this has to do with why the previous, uh, this previous headline was really important. And so when a lot of the gene editing or all of the gene editing I've talked about today has occurred or gene therapy, sorry, um, has occurred at a somatic level. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at the life cycle of an individual, you start out with your eggs and your sperm that fuse together to make um, a zygote that'll develop into an embryo. So let's say you do your somatic edit um, at the embryo or at the organismal level. And what this means is that you create this little patch of cells that now have a different DNA that have this editing event or this uh, therapeutic event that is now found in the embryo. As the embryo grows up into an organism, you keep this little patch of affected area. But when this organism goes on to create their own gametes, their own sperm and eggs, you actually see that none of the gametes will carry this mutation because the edit that was made was made in an area of the body that doesn't give rise to these gametes. Essentially, what this means is that somatic, somatic editing is not heritable. If this individual had X-linked skid and was cured of X-linked skid through their gene therapy, they could still have kids that have X-linked skid. The alternative to this and what Dr. He did that sparked so much debate was that he did a germline edit. So a germline edit is something that happens at the level of the gametes. So say you modify the sperm or you modify the eggs. And so now instead of a little patch in the embryo or in the organism having this modification, the entire organism has it. So the entire embryo grows up into an organism that has a mutation across the body, which means that um, their gametes, their offspring could potentially inherit the modification. And so say if you could cure X-linked skid at our germline edit level, the entire organism could carry the, the, the therapeutic event that could then um, mean their kids might not necessarily inherit it. 
However, what Dr. He had modified was a receptor that influenced HIV entry into the cells with the idea that he could make the, um, I believe the two daughters immune to certain strains of, of um, HIV infection. But this brings about the question of, is there an ethical difference between editing at the germline and somatic levels? Do y'all think this, that this debate is warranted? Um, that germline editing is, uh, should be acceptable or, or not? And feel free to put things in the chat about it. In the chat, it is warranted, although parents should have some level of say in this. Um, because it can easily go wrong and be easily misused. They shouldn't be able to design their kids like that. Yeah, and that, that brings about a really other good area because it's, if you could cure disease, that's very clearly good. And if you can cause disease as a model in humans, that would be clearly bad. But then there's this gray area of what if you could make your kid a little bit smarter, a little bit stronger, a little bit um, prettier, depending on whatever the beauty standards are, intelligence standards are of the culture. And this brings about a big question of, of designer babies is the term for that. Um, should people be allowed to design their, their kids or not? Um, which is something that comes up when you talk about germline editing. Okay, Michael also says, I feel that germline editing is something that should be researched, but I don't think it should be used on humans. Yeah, and that brings about a good point too, is if something is acceptable um, in lab, does that make it acceptable outside and, and vice versa? Um, and there could be great benefits to germline editing in lab and things like mice. Um, but it's, you know, there, if the benefits don't translate over into the real world, then how do we, how do we get society to draw that line? Yeah, there's not truly a, a right or wrong answer to a lot of these, which is what makes this conversation really interesting. Anyone have anything else they wanted to add before I move on? Yeah. Um, so then with all of that in mind, I wanted to kind of bring up a, the um, conclusion of that story with Dr. He's lab, which is that he was actually uh, jailed for three years and fined um, multiple thousands of, of dollars for what he had done. Um, and I guess this, this is very much in line with what the previous question was, but should this human gene editing be allowed in the future? Um, is what happened to him, was that acceptable? Um, was this the right response? And what should we think about moving forward? Only, yeah, only three years. Um, and Anushka, yeah, you're right. I actually have a slide for Gattaca after this. Um, if y'all have seen that movie or not, it talks about this um, 10, 20 years in advance to when all this actually happened. Yeah, it is an awesome movie. Yeah, it is highly exploitable, um, which I think is the big theme to this is we, it's like the, the classic Jurassic Park line of, um, oh, you spent so much time thinking about whether or not you could, you didn't spend any time thinking about whether you should. Um, and this does open a lot of avenues. Um, with, yeah, with great power comes great responsibility is very true as well. But the, yeah, the movie we're talking about is, oh, sorry, I showed it in the wrong slide, is Gattaca. So if y'all have ever heard about this movie before, if you haven't rather, um, it's a movie where essentially designer babies become the become commonplace. Um, everyone kind of has the capacity to design their child to be however they like. Um, but then the, the main character is actually born um, naturally or the parents opt out of doing the case, uh, doing any genetic um, modification of their kid. But then he grows up with defects that for us would be, you know, relatively normal, but he ends up kind of in a in an inferior cast of society. He doesn't get accepted. Um, he has to do a lot of sneaking around and the movie is about him trying to fulfill his, his identity and his potential in a society that rejects him for not having been genetically modified. Um, so I think it's more relevant now than ever and it's, it's definitely worth the watch because I think it, it gives a lot of philosophical insight into what humans really are or we define by our genetic sequence or by more than that. Um, it's fun to think about. Yeah, Michael brings up that he could see an argument for using it in families with histories of debilitating genetic disease. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point too, is, um, it could be exploited. It'd be great, you know, in a world without cancer, a world without Dutchings muscular dystrophy would, you know, would be amazing. Um, but then it also comes down to what do you define as a genetic disease? You see cases of um, people say that are deaf or blind, but because of that abnormality, you could say they um, develop greater capacities in other areas that allow them to see the world differently and that give them insights into things that others don't. And there's whole cultures around, um, around being like that. And so it comes down to what is a disease and what is just different. Um, and that, that line, blurring that line is where a lot of these controversial eugenics topics come in. But um, I do want to bring up the last thing, kind of what this isn't what's acceptable at a, at a societal level yet, because this um, a lot of CRISPR stuff hasn't come out. Sorry, these are all spoilers. Um, but uh, on, in terms of research and in a lab, what is currently permissible? And there's kind of three large categories um, that are currently in play. Um, one is completely exempt from reviews. You can do it in the lab without having to pass it by some kind of specialized board. The second is that you have to have it reviewed by the board. And in some cases, um, it could be viewed as acceptable and move forward. And then there are third case, the third category is, is completely prohibited. So don't even bother trying to present it because no one in their right mind would um, give you that kind of funding to do that kind of research because it's just not allowed. So cases that are exempt from review are things like in vitro stem cell experiments. So cases where you can grow cells up in a tube and, and modify them from there. And that's not really a big deal because you can't really grow them much up into anything. Um, the second category is creating new stem cell lines. So these stem cell experiments can be done um, without review unless you're trying to establish a new one. So you need justification as to why, because these stem cells tend to come from um, embryos that could theoretically develop into a human being, although they tend to be byproducts of in vitro fertilization, um, cases where not all the embryos are used. So there's debate as to whether or not it's a, it's a waste to get stem cells from them or not. Um, but regardless, you need some kind of review to be able to do that. You also need review to develop human embryos beyond 14 days. So why 14 days? That actually aligns with the development of this thing known as the primitive streak. And so the primitive streak is what's going to give rise to um, the spine, essentially the neural tube that, that will hold into the spine. Um, and so after 14 days, um, it's very questionable to, to develop human embryos beyond then. And then things that are prohibited are things like germline editing for reproductive purposes. So what happened with Dr. He, um, and things like uh, human cloning. So human cloning is currently uh, not allowed, although there are cases of animal cloning, if y'all have ever heard of Dolly the sheep. Um, but that is a completely different tangent um, for a different time. Um, yeah, and then I'm Pitch Gattaca, which I would heavily recommend to you all. But other than that, um, that's actually everything I had. So I wanna thank you all for your attention and participation. Um, I have a lot of fun talking about this stuff. So, oh, Anushka sent something in the chat. Okay, I think editing out genetic disease would have huge socioeconomic impacts, would be really expensive. So a wealthier family can eradicate deafness from their genes if people on the poverty line or from a less fortunate background won't have that option. They would likely have fewer resources for the condition as well. Yeah, and that's actually a really good point. Um, and something that I like to bring up when I talk about things like, uh, things like IVF, um, and so it's the idea that when in vitro fertilization came about, you could genetically screen your embryos beforehand to double check for any diseases and therefore potentially select kids that didn't have disease versus kids that did. And at the time that came up with a lot of debate because it's like IVF is really expensive and you're going to push this socioeconomic divide of the, the healthy upper class and the, the impoverished lower class that would have to deal with diseases they can't screen for. Um, IVF never really took off in a way that influenced this, um, that caused this, but there is very much a similar debate with CRISPR, the idea that you could genetically modify your kids um, in a way that, in, in the rich, that you couldn't, in those that couldn't afford it. Um, so yeah, that's actually a very important point to bring up, and I appreciate that you did. Um, but yes, thank you all so much once again. Um, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it and learned something out of it. I'm gonna stop my share.
um, I'm glad y'all found it interesting and got something out of it. So. <laughs>